Hi, I am Luke DeSmet, part of the Oros Americas support team. I will give you a global picture of the tools to capture and solve turbo machinery faults. If you have any questions, please send an email to info at oros.com. Thank you for registering with Oros. We have prepared a brief video on the topic of turbo machinery, which includes an overview and a demo of how the Oros product line can be used to perform turbo machinery diagnostics. So here's an overview of what we're going to be covering in this video. We'll go over the environment instrumentation, and then we'll cover the turbo machinery diagnostic basic tools. After that, we'll focus on the key features, which are full spectrum, subharmonic level, and runout compensation. And then we'll show the diagnostic with Orbigate with a case study, and then we'll show other techniques that you can use, such as ODS, balancing, and torsion. So with regards to the environment, usually turbines are connected to something like a generator, a compressor, or even possibly a load brake for simulating load for things like acceptance testing. For the speed measurement, if we have a gearbox connecting two rotating machines, you will need two separate speed measurements. The reasoning behind that can be seen here in the combined cycle trains diagram. You can see that the gas turbine starts up before the steam turbine, which is because it needs to get warm enough and build up enough pressure to start the steam turbine. This is the reason that two tachometers are recommended, especially for something like order analysis. The rotating speed setting here is going to be where in the software you will select what tachometer you want to be used for the different machines. It's very important to set these speeds because they will later be used to compute orders, orbits, and so on. Here on the right, we can see this machine train, which includes a high pressure and low pressure compressor, gearbox, and generator. We have proximity probes at all of our bearings, and then we also have our key phasers. You can use an optical probe or magnetic pickup, uh, whichever you have on hand or is most convenient will work out. One thing to keep in mind with proximity probe testing is that typically they have an output that's greater than the 10 volt peak that most analyzers will accept. So they require some sort of external signal conditioning. Uh, with the Oros analyzers, they actually have a 40 volt peak, so you can just directly connect the proximity probes right to the analyzer with no external conditioning required. As far as other instrumentation goes, we are using accelerometers. Common Excels today are the IEPE Excels for low temperature applications. Oros analyzers are equipped to use these also without any external conditioning required. We also have a velocimeter connected. Uh, this is a passive sensor that is also able to be connected directly to the Oros analyzer. So here in this image you can see an example of a way that transducers are commonly fixed to the bearing housing. It's super glued on there, uh, however the surface is prepped where you can see that it's sanded down to bare metal and then it was wiped off with some sort of solvent to help get rid of any dust or debris that was left on there that may uh, not help the glue hold as well. Removing the paint and affixing the transducer to bare metal is especially important if measuring on surfaces that contain very high frequencies, such as a gearbox that paint will interfere with those higher frequencies and your results will come out different than they would if it was bare metal. In order to perform the best diagnostics and monitoring throughout the run, we will also be monitoring temperature with thermocouples. In this case, we will need a conditioner. The image in the bottom left shows Oros's plug and play XPod solution for thermocouples, and there is also an XPod for strain measurements offered. The Oros Temperature XPOT accepts PT100 and PT1000 thermocouples along with J, K, T, N, and E types. Sometimes we are also interested in measuring the PLC process channel, which is pretty easy to do. All of these different signals coming from the multi-physics transducers are very powerful for the diagnostics and analysis, as you can imagine. Here on this slide, you can see that it isn't totally necessary to bring all of your own instrumentation every time. This is because the Oros analyzer is able to connect to the instrument panel that is used for online monitoring and then use those transducers for real-time analysis. Now, as an overview, we'll take a look at some basic tools. First, we'll cover basic notions such as position, orbit, and shaft centerline. Then we'll take a look at the overall levels and standards that we can use for turbo machinery analysis.
We'll also take a look at the Bodhi plot to determine critical speed. And after that, we will look at the waterfall spectra, which will help us better understand if there are any issues on the structural side or the rotor side. Lastly, we'll take a look at the orbital analysis. This is powerful due to its ability to have signatures with the orbits. So now, on this slide, you can see on the left a roller bearing with high transmissibility, which is typically used on smaller turbines and machinery. And on the right, a sleeve bearing, which has less transmissibility and more damping, which is typically used in larger applications. These bearings help us to understand that if you're trying to focus on the rotor movement, in the case of the sleeve bearing, it is much better to use proximity probes, which allows us to directly measure the vibrations from the shaft. For something like a pump, which is typically equipped with roller bearings, it is enough to use accelerometers on the housing due to the housing and shaft moving together. The vibrations coming from the accelerometers mounted on the casings are known as the absolute casing vibrations, whereas the movement measured from the proximity probes is known as the relative vibrations. Now, let us take a look at a couple of the main standards that are used for this type of application. ISO 10A16, which is used for non-rotating parts, and ISO 7919, which is used for rotating parts. For 10A16, usually we look at this type of table. On the bottom is the groups, 1, 2, 3, or 4, depending on the power, along with other machine details and the foundation type. The y-axis shows the threshold, either in millimeters per second or inch per second RMS. This overall level is computed in the frequency range of 10 Hz to 1 kHz for speeds above 600 RPM, and from 2 Hz to 1 kHz for lower speeds. Now, for ISO 7919, the table is very similar. Your bottom row with the groups and machine type and foundation are all the same, and your frequency range that you're calculating about is the same too. The one difference is that your y-axis now, instead of being in velocity, is just showing displacement either in microns or mils. These velocity and displacement values are easily calculated from your accelerometer data using the integration filters. Here you can also see an example of the overall trend of the displacement from 10 to 1000 Hz plotted against the rotation speed. This is the first relevant result we want to get from turbo machinery at transient speeds. And we can do the same calculation for the velocity. This is good to have to see the trend of the scalar values. Now, before the orbit is introduced, it's important to emphasize the fact that the fluid film in fluid film bearings is not uniform around the shaft. This is because the shaft is moving inside the housing and it is subjected to the process load. We also know that the oil thickness is directly related to the bearing stiffness, so it is very important to evaluate the stiffness at normal operating speed. For that, we usually use the shaft center line. So, we focus on the shaft center, which is the blue cross here, and when the rotor speeds up, the cross will move somewhere inside of the clearance circle. This clearance circle is the mechanical limit that the shaft is unable to move outside of. So, when the rotor is sped up, the cross will move to somewhere within this clearance circle, as shown here on the right. For the complete transient, from rest to normal operating speed, we will have many positions for the rotor within the clearance circle at different speeds. This complete line shown here is known as the shaft center line. Here we have one more animation to show how the shaft center line position works. At rest, the shaft is obviously just sitting at the bottom of the bearing. As we begin the slow roll, it is still sitting at the bottom of the bearing, albeit while spinning. As the runout begins, the shaft speeds up and moves about the bearing within the clearance circle until it settles at its position that it runs and operates at. Now, the AC or dynamic components are linked to the vibrations of the shaft. So, in this case, the rotor will vibrate and the trajectory will be the orbit. 
the orbit will be around the shaft average position. So this information coupled with the shaft centerline position information are very useful for getting the static position and dynamic behavior of the machine. This is especially important if there is a shock or a rub. Here we understand that the movement is a sum of the static and dynamic displacements, so the shaft centerline and orbits. As we have seen before, typically we have elliptical orbits, which is the main response to an imbalance for an anisotropic bearing. This is because the bearing does not have the same stiffness in the horizontal and vertical directions. So the orbit analysis here can be an additional signature diagnostic that you can do. The first shape here shows the elliptical shape due to an imbalance. The second one shows an imbalance coupled with a low natural frequency. This third complex shape shows a whip orbit which is caused by oil instability. The figure 8 shape here is caused by a combination of imbalance and misalignment. The fifth shape is due to a strong 1x and 2x close to the resonance. And the last banana shape here is due to 2x on one probe. Now, let's take a look at the Bode plot. First, the 1x, as you know, is a response to imbalance. When this imbalance excites the first bending mode of the shaft, we will have a resonance. This resonance will be transduced by a critical speed during a runup. For example here, we have a natural frequency very close to 50 Hz. It's the first bending mode, as you can see by the mode shape. Bode plot here shows both the magnitude and the phase, so we can check to see if the phase is rotating, and if, at the same time, we see a resonance, it means that we have a critical speed linked to a bending mode. All right, let's take a look at the link between the Bode plot and the waterfall. The Bode plot is a trend of the 1x values. Now, previously we saw the overall trends, and in this case, it is a 2D or scalar graph plotted versus speed. Now, the waterfall is collecting spectra versus either speed or time, with the vertical axis or color representing the magnitude. With a logarithmic scale, it's easy to see different things, such as vertical lines, which represent a frequency that is always present, or the diagonal lines, which are the orders. When these two cross, you end up with a resonance. So if we take a look at the Bode plot and we see any resonance in our application, we will be able to see the corresponding resonance in the waterfall on the right here. So we just saw the waterfall, Bode plot, shaft center line, and orbit. These are the basic results we need to perform a good analysis of the machinery. Now let's take a look at some of the key features dedicated to the turbine analysis. There is subharmonic level, which is an estimation of the energy below the first order, full spectrum, and runout compensation, which we'll cover more here in these next few slides. Regarding the sub-1x or subharmonics, if we have any fluid instability, we can notice two stages. Stage 1 is where the oil whirl appears, and stage 2 is where it becomes an oil whip and locks the first bending mode to the frequency of the rotor. The consequence will be a complex orbit, and the sub-1x will increase dramatically. In the order spectrum, we will be able to see the order components increase as well. A solution could be to modify the fluid circulation, possibly by changing the bearing geometry. An example of this being done can be seen in the tilt pad bearing. The tilt pad bearing consists of pads that are free to tilt, allowing the oil to create a self-sustaining film. So now let's go back to the high sub 1x. Here in red is our area where we compute the energy for the sub 1x, and this red line here helps to clearly show the two stages mentioned before. So as soon as this oil whirl at the low order crosses the natural frequency of the shaft, we will get the oil whip. So we have two phenomena happening. 
one that's linked to the order and the other that is linked to the frequency, which is why the sub 1x is relevant, because it means that we don't need to track one frequency and one order, we only need to look at the trend. Next, we'll take a look at the full spectrum, but first, just a couple of quick words about the precession direction. If a shaft's motion is in the same direction as its orbit, in this case, both clockwise, that is what's known as a normal or forward situation. If the motion and orbit are in opposite directions, as shown here, that is known as a reverse precession. Now, we get this reverse precession phenomenon, especially when we have two different stiffnesses in the bearing. Usually, the horizontal direction stiffness is weaker, and as a consequence, we will have two natural frequencies. In between these natural frequencies of the horizontal and vertical directions is where we will see these reverse orbits. So, the full spectrum can help us to easily detect this phenomenon. You might have some questions like what is the correlation of the full spectrum with the half spectrum or with the filtered orbits, or what can it do for you? So the full spectrum plot is the only one that really allows us to determine whether the rotor orbits are forward or backward. The other advantage is that the full spectrum is unaffected by the probe orientation or probe rotation, as is the orbit. Next, let's take a look at how the full spectrum is generated. We begin with the raw orbit, shown here on the left with all frequency content, and then the 1x filtered orbit is extracted from that. Now, we decompose that orbit into a circle. As you can see, this gray vector minus the red vector corresponds to this green radius and this orange radius. The blue elliptical orbit is a sum of the positive orange circle plus the negative green circle. So, as you can see here, the orange circle will show in the spectrum with orange peaks and the green will also be overlaid in the same graphs. This makes it so that we can easily see the positive and negative parts of the orbit and at a glance get an understanding of how it is moving. Now let's take a look at a significant case. Here we can see that if I have a circular orbit in the forward direction, I have no reverse components. And the same goes for the other direction. If I get a circular orbit in reverse, I have no forward components. Now if the orbit is in a straight line, both forward and reverse magnitudes are similar. For troubleshooting with full spectrum, this type of table can be found in the literature. An example on how to use it would be, if I had high forward and reverse components, it may be due to a rotor natural frequency, as seen here. Or, if they are high in both the 1x and 2x at the same time, it might be a unidirectional radial load. The last key feature we're going to talk about is runout compensation. Sometimes the probe sees displacement that may actually be caused by things such as scratches, electrical noise, or magnetic inconsistencies rather than actual displacement. We would like to subtract that noise out of our data so that all we are left with is the real displacement. So, in the software, it's possible to set a low speed slow roll. That low speed data is used for vector subtraction in order to compensate the runout and get rid of the noisy displacement. Now let's go over to Luke for a live demo of how this all works. Now I will show you a demo of Orbigate. The scenario is that I'm out in the field and I've set up my sensors and my clearance circle. I have just finished taking my measurement, so I switch to navigation mode and load my results. Orbigate allows me to call back any results regarding transient speeds. I am also able to call back the speed profile. I would like to overlay the 1x RMS and the overall RMS. I expect to have the same plot because I assume that the resonant energy will follow the 1x.
However, as you can see, that is not really the case here. You can see that I have a deviation between 3000 and 4000 RPMs. I would like to understand what happened over this large range. I therefore will display the order spectrum. To do this, I select the Add Windows function for Orbit and choose the order spectrum of my Y probe. This allows me to use my cursor in order to browse my measurement. This function is very convenient. On the far right graph, you can see that I can browse through my speed profile to speeds greater than 3000. Just before 2000 RPM, I have only 1x, as you can see, on my order spectrum. But as soon as I enter into this speed range, I have one subharmonic. You can see this subharmonic has an order of 0.375, so it appears that I have an oil instability. I therefore will display the orbits to check for an oil instability and will make a report to send to my team. To do this, I will add my whole orbit. You can see that this orbit is not closed. As Nick said, you will need more than one orbit in order to close a cycle. At 0.375, I need roughly three revolutions to complete one full cycle. I can easily go through the Analysis tab settings and display three revolutions rather than one. I do not need to play back the signal, I simply ask the software to display more. We can now see the orbit is closed. It is time to generate my report. For this example, I will select a template with one graph per page. I rename it Web1 Sub1x and I open the report which will generate and open the report. The next report that I would like to edit is the critical speed. You can see that at roughly 4,700 RPM, I have the phase rotation plus the magnitude amplification. So I'm interested in knowing the S max for the orbit and the critical speed. Therefore, I create the sub 1x report. Here is my template with one graph per page. My report is ready to be sent to my colleagues. So now I will focus on the resonance near the critical speed, so I will show only the results without the oil instability. I would like to have Smax, so I select the Smax data because I am interested in getting the size. Therefore, I put the cursor exactly on the critical speed. I now have the S max, the Bode plot, and the orbit shape, so I can now generate my final report, which will be named S max. You can see that in a few seconds I can generate at least two reports, which takes approximately one to two minutes, ready to be sent. As you can see, it is convenient to first do diagnostics in the field and then quickly generate reports before leaving the job site. And now back to Nick for the rest of the presentation.
Thanks, Luke. Now, just a few quick words about some other techniques. Now, we know we can use Orbigate to look at some of the rotating faults with the features that are focused on rotor issues. It may also be interesting to perform structural analysis using modal analysis with an impact hammer. If we have some high vibration levels on the bearing or pipes or something like that, ODS can help us go a little bit further into diagnostics and help us recognize and fix that issue. To do this, accelerometers are moved around the mesh of the structure or bearing and that helps us visualize how the structure is moving at specific frequencies. Multiplane balancing is also a useful tool for turbine analysis. If the machine is tripping due to high vibration levels, like in this case, I would like to balance the speed range before the machine trips. So this tool is used to balance the rotor by telling us where to add mass and how much mass to add in order to minimize these vibration levels and get the rotor as balanced as possible. Now to wrap up these other tools, we will just quickly cover torsional analysis. Torsional analysis is especially useful for turbines that are subjected to new components like they are as renewable energy becomes more and more popular. So to monitor torsion, we can use magnetic pickups or optical probes with zebra tape as you see up here in the top left. For more information about this torsional analysis, we have a paper published with GE about turbines and torsional analysis. Please feel free to contact sales at oros.com for a copy of this paper if you're interested for some more information. Thank you for viewing this presentation. If you'd like to see a little bit more about our offerings, please feel free to visit us at www.oros.com. If you have any questions or would like any more information that you can't find, you can also feel free to email sales at oros.com and we'll be glad to help you out. Thank you.